Well, I would like to welcome everybody to this week's uh, or this month's iteration of the um, Missouri Speaker Series, Big Money Speaker Series. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you. Um, we've gone to every other month, as you guys know, and um, all of our uh, presentations are archived online. So that's a really important thing for us, um, is to have that stuff as a resource. So tonight's presenter is Larry O'Donnell. I think most of you guys know Larry. Larry is the executive director of the Little Blue River Watershed Coordinate, uh, Coalition. He is a project manager for Healthy Rivers Partnership. He's a painter and all-around swell guy. Um, he's been doing this stuff for about mm, 17 years now and um, comes highly recommended. Larry's a subject matter expert in these kinds of things. So tonight he's going to give us some insight on the eight authorized purposes of the Missouri River. And with that, I'll turn it over to Larry. All right, well, thank you. So as Vicki said, I'm with Little Blue River Watershed Coalition. We do watershed education. We do things like the Missouri River Watershed Festival, which is stu a student festival. We do habitat restoration, which is basically uh, removing honeysuckle and replacing it with some native plants. Most of the native plants are still there. We do the Big Muddy Speaker Series. We've done this since 2011, uh, which at the time we said, oh, there's no way we can do it every month. But we did it every month for uh, however many years, and it wasn't until this year. And it's just getting harder and harder to find uh, uh, speakers that can actually commit and keep their commitment to a date. So, uh, However, we do have a speaker for October. Uh, Jim Ogle from the Freedom's Frontier, and he's going to be talking about uh, uh, Quindaro, the town of Quindaro, one of the first river towns. But so all the, also uh, Healthy Rivers Partnership, which is a program of uh, uh, Little Blue River. And we do things like uh, we've done a beer festival, Clean Water Makes Better Beer, and uh, beer is a continuing uh, theme throughout uh, our water efforts, uh, as witnessed by tomorrow evening with Sweetwater Beer take people out on the Missouri River, do cleanups. Uh, we've done an art show uh, for quite a few years, Art and Science on the River. Uh, some of these programs get a little old. Art and Science is being reimagined by its uh, originator uh, from Shawnee Mission South, Adam Fingleston. And we do festivals everywhere. So any way that we can educate people about the river and anything we can educate them about, like the eight authorized purposes, too much water, not enough water. So there are eight authorized purposes for the Missouri River, authorized by Congress for the Corps of Engineers to manage the river for. As we will see, that's difficult at best. Two million years ago, the uh, Missouri River actually flowed northeast to Hudson Bay. And today, the Missouri River, you're pretty much familiar with it. I did this thing in 2013 at, uh, for the speaker series, and we've updated it a little bit. So, but some of the slides are old, and I did notice today that this actually is supposed to be down here. The star is Kansas City, so this got moved in translation. The glacier pushed the Missouri, the Missouri River started here and used to flow to Hudson Bay. The glaciers moved it down and pushed it all the way down to Kansas City. This Missouri River was actually uh, ice melt where the river flowed at the edge of the glacier, which is why we have this weird right angle, because you usually don't see that in rivers. This river would generally go this way, or it actually used to cut across the state at an angle down there. But the glacier pushed it down and pushed it where it is today. It's a big watershed. It drains six of the United States, 12 million people. 25% of agricultural land is in the watershed. And it starts all the way up in Montana. Uh, I can't remember the name of that spring now. Bowers, Bowers Spring is where it starts. And uh, ends up at St. Louis, the longest river in the United States. It's actually longer than the uh, Mississippi River by 100 miles. Um, there was a lot of, it's 
We're the longest river? No, we're the longest river until we got satellites and GPS and they showed us who really was the longest river. If the United States had been uh, developed from the west, moving east, we would have found the Missouri River first instead of the Mississippi, and we would call the Mississippi a tributary of the Missouri. The lower, Missouri, the lower Mississippi actually has 45% of the water in the lower Mississippi it comes from the Missouri River. So it's a big river, covers a lot of area, lots and lots of uh, tributaries. Our history with it basically begins with the French uh, explorers, and they were here in the 1700s. Um, fort Orleans was uh, down by the Grand River. Uh, up here there was a fort at uh, Leavenworth that uh, by the time Lewis and Clark got here in 1804, the Leavenworth Fort had been abandoned for 30 years. So the, there's an association with Lewis and Clark and the Missouri River. They did not do the first exploring on the river. They just got the best publicity. So it was really the French explorers that brought the river to us. Problems with the river, though. It's a wild river. So the biggest problem was snags. Uh, it was shallow. It was braided. Uh, trees would get caught. It's a sand bottom. These trees are all caught in the sand bottom. The channel would change overnight. These trees were uh, could put a hole in the bottom of your boat, uh, especially when we got into uh, steam engines. From 1870 to 1889, what, 193 of 295 wrecks were caused by snag trees. Most of the other ones uh, involved shallow water and trying to push over sandbars. Uh, basically blowing up the boiler. So it was really difficult to navigate. But it was the main course uh, into the western uh, United States and uh, from St. Louis to Kansas City where the trails took off, three trails here, one to go to Santa Fe, one to go to Oregon, and one to go to California. So it was the main way we moved people in the early 1800s. Floods. Flooded all the time. Still floods. And they're a natural occurrence. I mean, this is uh, the top picture is uh, Thomas Hart Benton, and it's uh, entitled Springtime on the Missouri. And that's just what you did. You knew it was going to flood. And so you lived there during most of the year, down by where your crops were, and then when the floods came, you went to the high ground. You had to come back and rebuild the cabin, and it, if you've seen here, they, their cabin is up a little bit, but probably not enough. Because the water just keeps coming. So 1903 was a big flood in Kansas City. This is the West Bottoms, uh, down off of uh, 9th Street, I believe. No, Blossom House was uh, across from the Union Station down there, which is basically where Kansas City started. But flooding was a huge problem. Always floods on the, on the Missouri. So what are we going to do about it? Well, like I said, it's a big, big, big river. A lot of area. So we had two plans. One from the Corps of Engineers and one from the Bureau of Land Management. The Sloan plan was uh, basically designed for irrigation and... Uh, um, keeping the water where it was, mainly up north, but actually all throughout the basin. The pick plan was designed for uh, navigation and for uh, flood control. So the pick plan had uh, a series of lakes in the two northern states and uh, below South Dakota they channelized the whole thing. The Sloan plan called for a thousand dams everywhere to try and control the tributaries. So they compromised. They channelized the downstream. They put bigger, bigger lakes up in the Dakotas, and nobody was happy with any of it. 
So the Corps has been charged with keeping enough water in the lower Missouri for navigation, but not too much for flood control, and keeping enough water in the uh, lakes up in the Dakotas for irrigation, uh, water supply, uh, um, hydroelectric power. Hydroelectric power is a big thing up there. So they compromised with the Pick Sloan plan, which nobody liked, but basically came up with eight authorized purposes. So these aren't in order of importance. They're all supposed to be all the same importance. We'll talk about that a little bit later because flood control is certainly in the news these days. But flood control, the amount of water going anywhere, navigation, enough water for the barges to move up and down. And actually at the time it wasn't barges, it was more the steamboats when they were first looking at it. Hydropower, uh, it up in the, the lakes up there at the dams, generate a tremendous amount of uh, electrical power. Water quality control, which is a tough one, uh, and that, that's actually one that was added later uh, once they realized that they could con somewhat control the water quality by keeping things out of it. Water supply, there's, uh, we'll get into that, but uh, a, a bunch of uh, municipalities. Uh, I think in Missouri alone, six million people get their water out of the Missouri River, their drinking water. Recreation, uh, not just on the lakes, but also on the lower Missouri, and uh, fish and wildlife, um, which is an integral part of the whole system. So, navigation. In 1824 is when they first uh, came up with some money to remove the large tree snags. And these, this is a, a snag boat. Those bars on the front, they would tie around those trees and then back up and pull those things out. By the time they actually started doing this work, the navigation work and uh, uh, some of the channelization work, navigation had almost ceased on the Missouri River before we were using it to bring all the mercantile goods up, but when the railroad pretty much took that over. So by 1869, uh, it was all railroad that paralleled the river. 1945 for navigation. Originally they had uh, uh, gone with a six foot deep channel, uh, 200 feet wide, and uh, they realized that that wasn't deep enough. So then they changed it to a nine foot deep channel, 300 foot wide. And that will carry those barges because they don't, they don't ride very low. But there aren't many barges on the Missouri now. We have a lot more in Kansas City than we did uh, five years ago. The port reopened and we're getting four or five barges a month. They're carrying large bulky items, uh, salt, fertilizer, grain, uh, cement, asphalt, and uh, sand. There's a lot of sand that moves up and down the river. You see those sand dredgers out there, they are not keeping the river clear. They're actually mining sand which is a whole nother issue, but. So as far as flow in the Missouri, even without any barges on the Missouri, we would still need flow from the Missouri to go into the Mississippi because it's 45% of, of the lower Mississippi is Missouri River water. And without that water, now you're not gonna get any barges like this on the Missouri, but you do see these on the Mississippi all the time. On the Missouri, it might only be three deep and three wide. It's a narrower river. But that flow, even without na any barges on the Missouri, that flow from the Missouri is essential to barges on the Mississippi. They changed it a lot. All right, this is Kansas City. This is where they're in 1893. Uh, this is uh, Caw Point here, where the Caw Ri Kansas River comes in. This is the downtown airport. This was all uh, swamp, braided channels, uh, low water. When Lewis and Clark got here, they said this was two miles wide. It wasn't all water and six feet deep. It was 
everything, sandbars, swamp, uh, braided channels. This is where we put the downtown airport. Got rid of all this floodplain where the river used to overflow into, and we put it into this channel that comes right around here in Kansas City and kicks up. We cut off this bend. We cut off this bend. And this is uh, back when the counties were formed. This is Jackson County. Uh, the river was the boundary, and this bend was the boundary. Now the river go cuts across here. And so part of Jackson County is actually north of the river, and part of Clay County is south of the river because of how we've changed the river. But you can see this was all floodplain, and we greatly reduced it, and of course we've built in it, and we put up levees and basically totally changed the way it flowed here. It's a very muddy river, second muddiest river in the world. You hear about the Nile River and the silt. It carried three times as much silt as the Nile. And after the channelization program and the dams up north, we reduced the sediment flow past St. Louis by 80%. That's a huge amount of sediment. That's caused quite a few issues. Uh, it probably affects the uh, endangered species because the river isn't uh, as turbid and uh, as dense as it used to be. Uh, actually, a dirtier, darker river protects those uh, little fish as they move up and down, keeps them from predators. They're not able to see as well. And the uh, uh, sediment in it um, is important to the uh, uh, mouth down there in uh, Louisiana and the Delta Islands and uh, all of that, uh, the barrier reef islands. Bunch of that came from the Missouri River silt. We've stopped that, and then we cleared out those islands. And uh, you know the effect of that uh, with Hurricane Katrina, those islands actually act as a barrier, or as a, a, a buffer. And with those gone, the uh, effects of Katrina were much more severe than if those islands had still been there. And now their chance of being replaced is several hundred years just by from the uh, sediment in the Missouri River. This is a satellite map. You can see the Missouri coming into the Mississippi, and you can see for several miles all the way down past St. Louis how muddy it is compared to the Mississippi. They use that silt to help channelize. So the river was wide and low, and this is a, a classic example, this Indian cave bend up in Nebraska. 1934, it looked like this, wide. 1935, they started building these uh, structures out here. They're wooden jacks, posts pounded into the ground. They have mats uh, woven in between them of uh, uh, reeds, whatever. Uh, so that when the water would rise over that, and then it would slow them down, and it would, the, all the sediment would settle out to the point of, by 1977, this is all created land, 188,000 acres of new land from the channelization program. Now at the same time, we killed about 300,000 acres uh, by channelizing and cutting it off. But, this land here, this is a big issue these days because people who own this land seem to think it shouldn't flood. It used to be part of the river, you know? And this is much better than it used to be, but you can't expect it to not flood. But we're going to control the floods. Actually, these days we're going to try to manage the floods because 1917 there was the Flood Control Act. I think this is downtown Omaha uh, in 2011. Uh, 
I should have a picture of what that sta what that actually looks like. These statues are about 20 feet tall, and they're up on a little hill, and so this this is actually probably under a good 20 feet of water. This is how they try to manage it. 25% of them they want to keep permanent, and basically basically about 75% they want to keep permanent. This multiple use. This they have to have in there all the time. Multiple use is recreation, flood control, uh, um, hydroelectric, irrigation. But 16% of, of reservoir system, of the system is for annual flood control, and then 6% is for when it gets really, really bad. That's for the whole system. There's uh, basically five lakes that are uh, used for uh, flood control. Gavin's Point is a sixth lake, but most of the water comes in and goes right out. So uh, Oahu basically and Garrison hold the most water. But this is a big issue because you've got all these tributaries flowing into here. And these lakes that can only hold so much, they have to predict basically how much water is going to come in each year, the runoff, and then they have to get rid of that runoff every year before runoff from the next year starts. Hydropower uh, is another reason to keep the lakes going and the dams going. Sediment is an issue with the dams now because the system has been in effect for so long that sediment, the sediment that we've cut off from all those uh, upper tributaries is flowing into the uh, reservoirs and basically uh, filling them up. But hydropower, um, they had predict what they predicted, the amount of hydropower produced versus what they've, they're actually doing, four times the amount of what was predicted is the amount of hydropower that's uh, being produced off of these reservoirs now. So the electricity that comes out of those reservoirs up in the Dakotas is extremely important to that entire area of the country. Irrigation, now irrigation is one that didn't really uh, pan out. So the Pixlone plan, they were gonna have 5.3 million acres irrigated. By 1982, only 560,000 acres had been developed. That's a higher number now, but it's still very low compared to, it's less than a million compared to what they thought would happen. Water supply. So the lakes, Gavin's Point ends at the, the border of South Dakota, uh, just upstream from Sioux City. And that's where the, chan the uh, I was going to say that's where the channelized area starts, but it's not quite true because it's not channelized right out of Gavin's Point. You've got to go down about 40 or 50 miles before you get into the really channelized section. But downstream from Sioux City, uh, you've got uh, 40 major municipalities getting water out of the Missouri River, including Kansas City, uh, Kansas City, Missouri and uh, Water One, which uh, gives water to uh, Johnson County, all comes from the Missouri River. And uh, what you can see here, uh, a few of those cities, 17 of the cities, uh, drop water for three million people. Those numbers, of course, are higher now. And then there's power plants. So basically anybody that, that pulls water uh, needs water from the river and is built next to the river uh, is using that and depends on that river for whatever it is they're doing. So the power plants uh, have to have the water for cooling. Uh, if the rip levels are lower, this is actually, I don't know who that is. is that, I think that's water one. The pumps, these, these pipes here, their pumps are on those pipes, and they can raise and lower them based on levels. Right now, we're not really worried about low, low levels, but uh, 
that's a whole other issue here in Kansas City and in uh, some parts of the river where the bottom is falling out. When the bottom falls out, it means the water level is that much lower. It can undermine infrastructure, but uh, it, it can also uh, reduce the amount that your uh, pumps can take in. So being able to move these pumps up and down, I think they spent a million dollars on that, but it makes them uh, able to uh, adaptively manage uh, what they're doing with their pumps. Water quality. It's tough to manage for water quality when you've got such a, a huge area uh, because regulations are all localized. But um, basically we're controlling by permit anybody that discharges into the river has to meet certain permit requirements. And some of these power plants aren't real happy about that because they're using water that has been purified coming from the, uh, the local water system, which means it's got chlorine in it. In order for them to put it back into the river, they have to take the chlorine out. <clears throat> so they will tell you that the water they put back into the river is cleaner than the water they, that they get. And then fish and wildlife. They had the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act uh, recognizing the importance of fish and wildlife. When until 73 we came up with the Endangered Species Act because we realized that a lot of these, this wildlife is disappearing uh, because of things we've done. And when we channelized the Missouri River, we really had no clue as to how fish and wildlife reacted and, and uh, what the relationship there was with the river. Back in 1994, Fish and Wildlife Service with the Corps of Engineers issued a biological opinion and they came up with an agreement with the Corps of Engineers to try and restore some of the habitat for, uh, what is it, the least turn, the uh, pallid sturgeon and the, uh, some kind of plover. Piping. Piping plover. What's important for some of these species, and they're, they don't really know. Uh, it's, it's all experimentation. They know a lot more than they uh, used to. But uh, sandbars uh, are important for uh, chicks to be reared on, and uh, backwater habitat is important for the uh, pallid sturgeon. So they introduced the spring pulse. Spring Pulse was supposed to simulate what the river used to do and uh, basically create habitat for, these, for this wildlife. Well, they did it in 2006, 2008, 2009. They found that it was ineffective to do what they wanted to do and stopped with the Spring Pulse. There is no more Spring Pulse. They have replaced that with a drawdown and a rise. So instead of just adding water to the river for a spring pulse, they first lower the amount of water going into the river and then they add it back in. Basically to try and create that habitat again. But the spring pulse uh, in 2018 came out of the uh, river management manual. It's, it is no longer a, uh, considered a viable alternative. When they channelized it, we lost 500,000 acres of habitat, including a bunch of river. And uh, we restored about 166,000, or we haven't restored that much. That's to be restored. I think we've only restored 50,000 of it or something. Uh, and when we're talking about restoring it, these so this was an oxbow went around here and was cut off. And so to restore this wetland area and, and all oxbows, just like that downtown airport, are basically flood overflows. And so you get a lot of uh, wetlands in that area and those, that's the habitat rich areas. So what they've started doing was, this is where the river's channelized and going. I think this is Jameson Island actually. And uh, they cut this channel. Actually, they just started 
to cut the channel and then the river cut the rest for him. This is an overflow for high water and it'll get this entire area here and this entire area over here will become flooded and uh, habitat for wildlife uh, as you can see down here. That's what they're doing for habitat loss and uh, for the fish and wildlife. Then there's recreation. The mainstream lakes are used heavily, 60,000 visitor hours in 2000, but also more and more we have kayakers and canoers on the river. A lot of this in Missouri, in this area, comes from the MR340, the Missouri River 340, which is a race from Kansas City to St. Louis, 340 miles, four days, you get 88 hours to complete it. It's been going on now for, I'm not sure when it started, 2007? 12 years. 12 years? May or may not happen this year, based on river levels. <laughs> So recreation, uh, not just at the lakes, but on the river. And um, one thing that, uh, when we first started going out on the Missouri River, it was all cat fishermen. And, uh, and, but there's cat fishermen out there all the time. But that was pretty much what it was limited to. And now we see a lot more recreation even here in Kansas City. So with all these basically uh, conflicting uh, purposes uh, where you have to keep uh, enough water up north for uh, half of those purposes but you still have to keep enough water uh, down south for uh, navigation and water supply uh, and you still want to control the flow for uh, flood control originally it was all flood control Navigation was the excuse, basically, they used, the, the cities agreed to for, uh, uh, because of what it did with flood control, because they're putting it in a channel, keeping it out of the uh, floodplain. So in 2010, there was a, a study, a, an authorized uh, study from Congress um, to basically review the authorized purposes. There was a series of public meetings up and down the basin, and uh, Missouri kind of freaked out about it. <laughs> uh, Missouri used to emphasize flood control, I mean uh, uh, navigation, but uh, because there was that was where most of the navigation was, but now the emphasis has come on uh, flood control. And uh, <clears throat> they're worried that all these other purposes will outshine what they want the river to be used for. But without considering all the uses, considering how they're actually used today, uh, you really can't come up with a uh, realistic management system. So... Thanks to Missouri and uh, uh, some other pressures uh, in our Congress people, um, they basically took the money out of that study, so killed the study. So we don't want to talk about it because we're afraid of what people will say. The river kind of makes us talk about it. <laughs> the uh, 2011 flood. <clears throat> which was basically a flood caused by uh, heavy rains in the upper basin and uh, um, high snow melt or high snowpack in the mountains and on the plains. Uh, when that when the runoff flows, if the ground's frozen, it's all going to run off. How fast it happens. Uh, how fast the snow melts, all of those are considerations to figure out how much runoff you're going to have over what period of time. Well, what happened was uh, in uh, eastern Montana, 
they had uh, oh, what, what, incredible amount of water. They had like a year's worth of rain in a 12-day period. Well, that was historic. They've been keeping track of this stuff for over 100 years. Uh, they hadn't had anything like that before. It filled the reservoirs, it filled the reservoirs to the point where water had to be released or the dams would fail. So water gets released into the lower basin. And that was basically what caused the flood of 2011. Now, the flood of 1993 and also the flood this year is caused by rain in the lower basin where there aren't nearly as many controls and we can only predict so much. And so all of that out in Nebraska and the, the uh, um, Pick's plan for the, uh, or was it Sloan's plan for the Thousand Lakes, um, none of that really happened. So there isn't any control in tributaries. Coming out of Gavin's Point, uh, flow is typically about 70,000. Uh, this time of year, it's going to be maybe down to 30. Uh, right now, uh, uh, this time of year, it'll be down to 30. It's not typically 70. It's what we're releasing right now is 70,000 CFM. So way over twice what normally would be going into it. You get down to Kansas City, and we've got uh, everything we picked up from the tributaries. So you've got 70,000 cubic feet per second moving out of uh, South Dakota. You get down to Kansas City, we're up to 140,000 cubic feet per second. You get to St. Louis, and we're uh, up to almost 300,000, over 250,000 uh, cubic feet per second. So, how do you control it? Well, you look at how the river used to work. And so giving the river more room through levee setbacks, instead of rebuilding bigger and better, which is catchphrases these days, we're going to build a, a bigger levee, a more robust levee. The river still needs to go there. The lesson is, look at where the river wants to flow, and I'm sorry, Hamburg, Iowa, move. You know, they're, they're about two miles from the foothills. There's something like 400 people live there. But they keep rebuilding, and they're a long ways from the river. But it's all flat. It's all floodplain. So there are areas where we just shouldn't be, and it's not economically viable for us to be. But that's the buildings. That's the cities. We've known this. We've known it from 2011. We knew it from before that, uh, from a, a report that came out 17 years earlier. And the governors of the states decided that flood control should be the priority. This is after the 2011 flood. Just recently, they've uh, reiterated that. And some of them think that uh, uh, fish and wildlife ought to be taken off because they seem that uh, they feel that that was somehow a cause. All right. The 2011 flood was not caused by two birds and a fish. People say the Corps shouldn't have to waste precious resources on building wildlife habitats. You know, that's. That's kind of our typical Western way of thinking, was that if we don't know how it fits into the system, it, then it's, we can get rid of it. So it doesn't matter. But it's a chain effect. And these are uh, indicator species. So it's not just two birds and a fish that are affected, but it's the entire habitat of the Missouri River. But the Corps has also said that uh, the spending does not come from other purposes. It's added above and beyond. And they found the spring pulse to be ineffective and discontinued, but people still think that there is a spring pulse, and they still think that uh, floods are caused by the spring pulse. Well, it doesn't even exist. 
But this is the kind of thing that uh, you run into up and down the river, all up and down the river. There's a lot of different opinions, um, and it's a, a huge problem. So what's needed? I mean, things have changed, right? They're not the same as they were in 1800. So there's been large economic and social changes. We need to review the, the uh, priorities. And they need to reflect what our current values are and what our current scientific knowledge is. Current scientific knowledge is a big one because when they came up with these authorized purposes and they decided to channelize the river, they were going on 40 years of data, which was all they had. But as we have seen, it's not enough. So the fluctuations in the river, the huge rises, and then, you know, we're, I've been talking a lot about flood control uh, because the drought, which was in the, uh, the 80s, a six-year drought, uh, is far from our minds at this time. But that's a whole other issue. Lakes up there uh, were going dry. There were people that had docks, and the water was a mile from the dock. And, of course, those people were complaining, too, because, you know, you can't hardly have a fish camp uh, if your lake's a mile from the camp. So, too much water, not enough water. But what is obvious is that we need talks. We need to be real about how the river's being used and how we want to use it in the future. And we need to come up with a consensus Consensus, of course, being like Pick Sloan, meaning nobody's happy and it only half works. But at least it's a consensus that's much farther down the road with much more information than when we ever started. And then there's the whole, let's take water out of the river and put it somewhere else. Fracking being one of those things. Fracking goes down... Uh, basically injects chemicals into the, uh, the rock, into the cracks, the crevices, and uh, releases the oil. They pump all that stuff back out. They've got toxic water. They can't put it back in the river. They've basically taken it out of, the, out of the river, and it won't go back into the watershed. Fracking isn't the only taking water from the river. Uh, there's been a proposal on the board for a long time. Colorado uh, and western Kansas, but especially Colorado and Denver, uh, are short of water. Uh, western water law is different than uh, eastern water law. Water uh, in uh, the west is allocated uh, to river users, basically on a historic first come, first serve basis. Whereas in uh, the east, like Missouri, all of the water in Missouri belongs to the public, not the land underneath it, not the stream bed, but the flow, the water in it. So you've got, um, there's a proposal to take water from uh, the Missouri River, uh, I don't know, north of Leavenworth, and pipe it to Denver. That'll never happen, but a lot of people wish it would. Uh, I think we've learned enough by now to know that it is not a good idea to take water out of one watershed and put it into another. It's part of the system. It needs to recharge itself. You, uh, it's kind of like the Ogallala uh, Aquifer. The, large, basically underground river. It's, it's groundwater, so it's not really a river, but it covers five states. We are drawing down more water out of it, pulling it up out of wells, using a lot of it for irrigation. They actually say that uh, they can tell in Chicago when they're irrigating in western Kansas by the rise in humidity. So Taking the water out of the basin and putting it somewhere else, not a good idea. Fracking, not a good idea. Uh, full of uh, uh, toxic waste. Um, we're getting uh, 
natural gas from it. We're getting, we're getting fossil fuel energy out of fracking, but it's short term. It has a lot of hazards associated with it. There are, uh, when you're taking that much water out and you're uh, cracking the ground like that, uh, we're creating uh, uh, earthquakes. Northern Oklahoma and southern Kansas have an incredible amount of small earthquakes now. Uh, up in Pennsylvania, there's areas where uh, it's affected the drinking water and uh, you can't drink uh, the water out of your well anymore. So, just a whole other issue. You've got the eight authorized purposes and then you've got this people constantly wanting to take water out of the system and uh, put it back uh, in someplace else. And so basically that's it. Uh, what do we do? The speaker series uh, and the big muddy cleanup. We do cleanups on the Missouri River. Which, uh, uh, you know, we get uh, maybe 10 tons of trash. Uh, we'll have 150 volunteers. That's the important part. Getting volunteers out there. We take them out on the Missouri River. Most of them have never been on the river before. They've stood beside it. They feel it's dangerous. And you look at it and you see the, uh, the boils and the, the uh, uh, whirlpools, the whirlpools that aren't really whirlpools. All that is a reflection of the bottom and things that are on the bottom. Those big bubbles that come up in the whirlpools. Um, that's basically just air pockets passing over uh, sunken trees and uh, different changes in the bottom. So there's nothing out there that'll suck you down. Uh, there is a, a strong current, maybe three to five miles an hour. But the way the river's been engineered, it keeps itself clear. The current flows from side to side based on these rock structures they have. So it meets a rock structure and pushes the current this way. So you can actually float from here to St. Louis probably without touching the shore and without putting uh, a paddle in and just float because the current will carry you down along the side, back across to the other side and follow that channel all the way through. Getting people out on the river to uh, see that and understand what the river is and uh, what a valuable resource it is is uh, basically why we do all of this stuff. And that's kind of a short uh, version of the eight authorized purposes. So anybody have any questions? Questions? We're, we're taping, so I need you to use the mic. Thanks. You mentioned that the bottom was dropping out of the river at some places. Would you explain yeah, that? Yeah, in Kansas City. It's dropped, uh, I don't know, probably 15 feet in the last 20 years. The bottom falls out. So the upper, the top, so when the bottom falls, all the water lowers. So if you have a, a pump here that's sucking water and the bottom falls, your water's below where the pump is. So that's a, that's a, a huge issue and they, they spend a lot of money correcting that. Kansas City, they don't really know why. There's several, several, uh, causes, probably a combination of causes. One of them is channelizing. And we took away that floodplain, which was the downtown airport, where the river here in Kansas City is at one of its narrowest points, and it makes a right angle turn. That's a whole lot, and every, also every time you straighten the river, cut out an oxbow, it speeds up the water flow. When you speed up the water flow, the force will cut the bottom deeper. So that's one of the reasons, because we've channelized it and the amount of water, water runoff that we have going in here. Uh, another reason is probably runoff that comes from the city because of the huge increase in runoff. Um, I had those numbers. Park, it's, we get about 40,000 uh, uh, cubic feet per second increase between above Kansas City and below Kansas City. 
and that's from the tributaries of Kansas River, the Blue River, the Little Blue River, the Fishing River, and all of those are holding more flow than they used to during storm events because our whole system is designed to get water away from us as fast as possible, and so we put it into pipes and we move it to the river as fast as we can. So as an individual, uh, one thing that we can do is reduce the amount of runoff that comes off of our property. And so if all the individuals in Nebraska and Kansas and all those tributaries that we showed where they wanted to control flow on them but never did, the only way we can control flow on those now because we're not going to build dams because dams basically become ineffective and their whole problem in themselves, including the silting in. Dams silt in all the time. And so that's, that's a big issue, and they really haven't figured out how to deal with that. They're trying to do it uh, with the lakes up north. But uh, so increased runoff, channelization, and then the dredging for the sand. They're mining sand. Uh, here in Missouri, in the Kansas City, is some of the best sand in the world. Uh, it's super fine because it's been in the river and the water has uh, worn it smooth. And it's also uh, extremely pure, free of other chemicals. So its purity is what really uh, drives its quality. And uh, Corning fiberglass is here in Kansas City because of the Missouri River sand, because they want that sand for glass. So the dredges, they give them a permit to take so much sand, and they used to do a big hole, and then move on and do another big hole. Well, you do a big hole, you've got water flowing here, it's gonna go down into this big hole. When it goes down, it does what they call head cutting. It increases in force, and basically cuts this slope back and back and back. And this can go all the way up tributaries everywhere until it hits a hard point, like uh, the uh, 635 bridge uh, on the Kansas River. So they change the way, they, they still get to pull sand, although they're not giving as many new permits as they used to, but they've changed the way they, they do it and they have to do it over a five mile section now and they do a little bit and move on a little bit and move on a little bit move on so they're not increasing that uh, downward flow in a large amount. How they're going to solve these issues they're not even sure what causes them all uh, other than they know it's there and uh, they're working on it. Uh, it was dropping out uh, up north of St. Joe, and that seems to have cured itself. So it's basically a phenomenon that uh, has come to light in the past 15 years, and uh, they're still working on it. That's called bed degradation, and there are some really good studies out. If you want more information on the bottom of the river and what it's doing, that bed degradation study will help. The Mid-America Regional Council is leading a, a group of about 20 partners. And so if you go to Mid-America Regional Council uh, on their website, they'll have a whole area about uh, bed degradation and what they're hoping to do about it. You have another question? This is really related to the other question. Um, if, the, um, if the bed of the river is dropping, at least at that point, uh, or is, is that undercutting the levee? Is there concern about that? Yeah, there's definitely concern about that. Uh, and at this point, I think they used some of the money they got from uh, the 2011 flood. Uh, which was money to uh, rebuild and uh, basically beef up the levees. And so they've done some work uh, on the bottom of them. Uh, other than they've done work that you can't see besides the work where they've replaced the rock and, and uh, 
raise the levy a little bit. When, uh, I heard a rumor the other day that the state or the Corps released a half a billion dollar job to raise all the levees three feet. <laughs> My boss came back from the state and said the Corps is going to raise every levee three feet. We mow, the, we take care of the levees in the Kansas City area. It's our responsibility. Uh, I have no doubt that people would like to see that, but uh, at the same time, uh, we know it has a limited amount of effectiveness. And the problem with levees is the water still has to go somewhere. And we definitely want to protect our infrastructure <laughs> and uh, uh, our economy, our, uh, uh, basically the cities. Uh, but the farms too. But that water has to go somewhere, and you, you can't really levy the entire system. Uh, there is no... And the core doesn't even own all the levies. The core own, doesn't own hardly any of the levies, actually. So <laughs> they're talking about giving money to different districts, and the different districts operate differently too. You know, so I think in Kansas City there's four levy districts. So uh, I, I just, <laughs> I, I haven't heard, well, I did hear it from somebody, but I haven't heard it other than that, and uh, it just does not sound feasible. It sound, and it I have like not heard how we're paying for it. And that, I think, is a, a real question, is where's the money coming oh, from? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's been talked about for a long time, but it's always been a funding issue. I mean, Congress doesn't want to fund, and that would have to be a congressional allocation. So, I mean, the core doesn't get to decide what they're going to do. They get money from Congress or they don't. That could be what they're talking about when they say they're going to rebuild bigger and better. But I think there's uh, this year there's 44 levy breaks. Uh, they think it'll be three or four years before they're, uh, they have all of those levees repaired. Good luck. I mean, what? We keep doing the same thing and expecting it to somehow change. The only thing that's really changed is the amount of rain we get in a short period of time. And for whatever reason, whatever the cause is, it doesn't matter. The fact is it's there. It's just like uh, yesterday, where we got an inch of rain in less than an hour. Where does it all go? Push it all down to the next town. Let that flood out. Bales? It comes on and then off. It's, I got it. Thank you. Um, are there any concrete specific places that you're aware of especially in the region where they are pulling where there would be a floodplain created now that wasn't there before i mean there's talk mm -hmm. among people who know that this is an ideal situation but are you hearing of anything happening in that direction uh not really uh i think and Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. FEMA, are you here, Harold? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll put you on the spot, <laughs> see if you even know. Uh, do you know of any levees that are not being uh, rebuilt the way they were? Or I, 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 don't, even, I don't even think uh, the system allows for that. No, I don't uh, know of any that are not being rebuilt. You know, they, they allow you to repair what the damage that's been done. They, they're, uh, so pretty much they're just repairing what's been done and hoping it won't rain. Write your congressman, especially Missouri. Uh,
Everybody likes to talk in sound bites. And it's convenient to say that the floods were caused by two birds and a fish. And we know that that's not true at all. Uh, the big thing that came out of the 2011 flood was the Corps now has the ability to use adaptive management. So they can actually look at what's going on at the time and change what they were planning to do based on what is happening. Before, they had to come up with a plan and stick to the plan. So that's really the biggest change. And uh, that, I think, will eventually lead to uh, levies being moved. Uh, and I'm sure some private levies are, uh, uh, people are moving them back. You know, there's uh, some, some of the levies are just owned by farmers. Others, uh, by, you know, by farm districts. So uh, they're, you're just trying to protect your land. Uh, it's a trade-off. You know, there was a guy, a Missouri farmer, uh, in the news in the, after the 2011 flood, and he's going, you know, we've lived here, I've lived here, my family's lived here uh, for generations, and uh, it used to flood, you know, every other year. And now it might flood every five or seven years, and I think that's an improvement. So some people realize the limitations and others are still uh, suffering under the delusion that we can actually control the river. And all we can really do is try to manage the flow and we have to manage for a lot more than we have been. I'd like to make one comment and that is when Larry was indicating there are things you can do, public meetings, make your voice heard. I have seen people brought to tears at public meetings because somebody spoke their heart. And that sounds flowery and all that stuff, but during 11, I was going to those flood meetings and it was brutal. You know, these, watching these core people just take the heat, but people were saying what they wanted to say. And it really does make a difference. Um, when we spoke with people that uh, they had never had anybody call them before. So we, I really encourage you to do that. Um, I'm going to take one more question, and then we're going to cut the official part off. Larry will hold court in the bar, and you guys can grab a beer and enjoy another visit. When you talk about flooding, that mostly, I assume, is below Gavin's Point Dam. Do they have any issues with flooding above? Uh, oh, absolutely. The, that area? 2011, they flooded everywhere. Because the 2011 flood uh, was a result of uh, all the reservoirs being full. And so, yeah, uh, and there's tributaries that flow into the reservoirs, uh, the Niobrara being uh, uh, one of the big ones. Uh, and so, yes, flooding along the Niobrara, uh, flooding in Fargo, uh, all the downtown uh, was wiped out, so yes. And that's the whole thing. I mean, you've got this huge system you can't just manage it one way, especially when you've got lakes up north to hold the water and nothing down south to control it. And so this year, runoff was high uh, in, into the lakes, and uh, they have to release a lot. Now, after 2011, people were saying, well, we just need another lake, or we need, to, we need to more space in the lakes to hold this water. But they're taking the runoff from one year, getting rid of it over that year before it starts in the next year. And study after study has shown that it would not make any difference to have more space because of the amount of water. The 2011 flood, more space would, would have not made any difference. It still would have uh, uh, overflowed. There was what they had, uh, I forget the numbers, something like, uh, uh, 110,000 acre feet uh, that they could store but and that they got rid of for that year but uh, what came in was 225,000 acre feet so you another big hole in the ground doesn't really solve the problem because it's not just that simple and that would only handle runoff uh, to the lakes 
And then you've got everything from South Dakota to St. Louis, all those rivers, uh, tributaries, uh, dumping their water into it. So there is no easy fix. Uh, but the most viable one, and this is one that we've uh, learned more and more of within the past 30 years, uh, not just with uh, the Missouri River, but with a lot of the things we do. Uh, let's go back and look at how the system operated before we started interfering with it and see if we can mimic those conditions because we, weren't, we didn't have the floods like that before. Um, I, as soon as I say that, I mean, we, we talk about uh, flooding on the Missouri, and there were lots of floods, but they were short-lived. Water would spread out into the floodplain. It wasn't any of this huge floods going on for three and four months because we have so much water up here that we were trying to control typically that water. So like in 93, uh, if they had not had the dams up there with combined with uh, what the runoff was down in the lower basin, Kansas City definitely would have been flooded. So it cuts off some peaks, but um, it's a huge issue. I don't well, thank envy you. them at all. I'm cutting you off, you're done. No, um, I'd like for everybody to give Larry a round of applause. Larry does a ton of stuff that he's never recognized for, so clap for him now. And then, um, again, we would uh, look forward to talking to you guys over in the green room. Thanks for coming tonight, guys. We'll see you in October. <laughs>